up yourself as friends, whether you're viewing from the comfort of your home or wherever you are. It's a blessing to be here with you, to join you, and to worship with you on God's blessed Sabbath. I want to thank the leadership of the Bay Roberts Church for inviting me to speak to its members and its friends and well-wishers. God is good. What do you say? Amen. All the time, God is good. And today, I'm pleased to be breaking the bread of life with you. For the next 30 minutes or so, I want to speak with you under the caption, Let go and live. Let go and live. The scripture for meditation today that I would like to share comes to us from Mark 10, verse 17 to 27. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. It says, verse 17, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. The man said, Good teacher, he asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your mother and father. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And said to him, one thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Today, beloved friends, we want to talk a little bit about holding on to things that prevent you from following Christ completely. The story is told of an old trap used to catch monkeys. Something similar to this. And what these hunters would do is that they will make a hole in a coconut, small enough for the monkey's hand to go in. And they would put something like a fruit, a banana, or something that would lure the monkey to the trap. And when the monkey got hold of that, that treasure, that treat, that fruit, he would find it difficult to let go. And even if the, the hunters are coming, the monkey would be so fixated on the goal that he would not let go. Today, beloved friends, I don't know what's in your jar. I don't know what you're holding on to that's hold that's that's, that have you captive, but you got to let go so you can live. you got to let go so you can live. Because if you keep holding on, there is no freedom. Let go and live. What are you holding on to? And is it really worth it? These are some of the questions I would like us to ponder today as we worship God in spirit and in truth. Let us pray. Our loving God and our Savior, we are blessed, Lord, because we have the privilege to be in your presence. We are blessed, Lord, because we went through a week that could have gone sour for many of us, but you saw it fit to bring us to this point. And we have the privilege of receiving a message from you today. Mighty God, I pray that you will hide me behind the old rugged cross today again and anoint me once again, Lord, so that my voice will not be heard. But Jesus will speak from on high and your name will be glorified and your people edified. Mighty God, may my face be not seen, but you exemplified today. Jesus Speak now, your servants await. You see, the thing is that we hold on to will 
hold us captive. Our scripture reading gives us an insight in a very popular story, one that we know quite a bit about, the rich young ruler and the kingdom of God. And verse 17, we see this young man coming to Jesus and he falls on his knees before him and says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answered and said, Why do you call me good? This is important. The way Jesus answered this young man is important, and we'll get to that in a minute. He says, no one is good except God alone. Now understand, beloved friends, Jesus is man, but Jesus is God talking to him. And so we find a very interesting thing in his response to this young man. Why would God ask him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. Verse 19, Jesus tells him that you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false witness, false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your mother and your father. You see the interesting thing about Jesus' response is that this young man came to Jesus seeking a way, not the only way. He came looking for a teacher, but not for Jesus Christ, the Savior. Are you with me? He did not understand who exactly he was coming to and what exactly he wanted. The teacher declared all these things you have Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. The scripture tells us that Jesus looked at him and loved him. And gave him the pronouncement. He said, one thing you lack. Go and sell everything you have and give to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. Jesus instructs him to let go of everything that he had, let go and he could live. And the Bible tells us, beloved friends, at, at hearing this, that his face fell. The Bible says he went away sad because he had great wealth. He went away sad because he was not willing to let go of all he had so he could enjoy the liberty that Jesus Christ offers. In other words, he was not willing to separate himself from the treasures that he has. The Bible tells us in Matthew 6 verse 19 to 21, it says, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Verse 20, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your, your heart will be also. You see, beloved friends, God is not against you having wealth. But God is against you putting this wealth above a relationship with him. You, are you understanding me? Verse 24, the Bible tells us that no man can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other. Or you will be devoted to one or despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You see, beloved friends, this rich young ruler had such a great connection with what he has accumulated. And you can imagine he must have worked hard, studied hard, put in long hours on the job, made many sacrifices. He felt very attached to what he had, but he was not willing to let go of this attachment and follow Jesus Christ. And that is where the problem is today. What are you holding on to? What do you put above Jesus Christ? What do you 
find is in your way of following Christ and making a complete surrender to his will. Verse 23 of our scripture reading. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eyes of a needle than for a, someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Today, the question is, beloved friends, who can be saved? As we live in these unprecedented times, times that we have not seen before, many people are anxious, many people are fearing. Who can be saved in these times? I want to submit an answer to that question today. That if you must be saved, you must let go and surrender completely to God. That is the individual that will be saved. The individual who lets go and surrenders completely to God. Jesus looked at them and said, What with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. I'm here to let you know, beloved friends, that though circumstances and situations may seem difficult in your life, God can make it possible for you to let go of the things that you find so enticing. The songwriter says, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily I live. I surrender all, I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me Jesus. Take me now. Nothing but a full surrender to Jesus Christ will guarantee eternal life. Turn your Bibles with me to Revelation 3 verse 14 to 18. And we read a few passages Concerning the Laodicean church, verse 17 in particular, the Bible says, You say, I am rich and have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You see, the state of the Laodicean church, beloved friends, is that they feel they are rich. They feel they have no need of anything. Their dependence is not upon God. Their dependence is on themselves. They feel self-sufficient. But God is saying to the Laodicean people, God is telling, saying to the church in the last days, to you, my beloved friends, to all of us today, that our sufficiency can only be found in Jesus Christ. It says, verse 18, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. The simple message for us today is that we ought to let go of the things that we feel we have value and attachment to and gain a firm grasp on Jesus Christ. We got to let go so we can live. In Matthew chapter 4. Jesus goes on an extensive fasting. And verse 8 we see the devil. Taking Jesus on a very high mountain. And showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said, all this I will give to you if you bow down to me. But Jesus rebuked him. But just 
as that was a test for Jesus, it is a test today. It's a trap today that the devil is using to hold us captive. He's showing us the entice, exciting things of this world, the enticing things of this world, and trying to hold us captive by having our eyes fixed on these things. You see, the devil knows quite well what he has lost back in heaven, what he could never regain. And his intent is to keep you from getting there. Beloved friends, we must let go of these things. We must get, let go of our grasp on the world, lest we will die. In 1 John 2 verse 17, the Bible tells us that the world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God will live forever. Beloved friends, there is nothing in this world that should keep you apart from Jesus Christ. There is nothing of value in this world that should keep you apart from, the, from, from having a saving relationship with God. The Bible says, Will you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? And so we see, beloved friends, that holding on to these things, holding on to these things is only to your own detriment. Only when we let go can we live. John 2, verse 15. 1 John 2, verse 15 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. For if anyone loves the world, Love for the Father is not in them. Love for the Father is not in them. The Bible is clear. It says we cannot serve God and money. We cannot be in love with the world and be in love with God. We, we cannot be crazy about the world and crazy about God. It must be either or either. We need to let go off of self. Selfishness and all the, the our, our carnal nature. The Bible said in Matthew 16 24, then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You see, we have to let go of these things, beloved friends, because holding on will only lead to our destruction. The rich young ruler was not ready for a complete surrender. He was not ready to leave his wealth and all that he has acquired, all that he had worked for, all his status and his influence to, to follow Jesus completely. He left Jesus' presence sad because he had too much. The irony of the story is that he left Jesus' side, not realizing that he was talking to the only one who could grant him salvation. The second point, the second point I want to make is that sometimes we hold on to bad habits that lead to sin. You see, the devil is in this business of deceiving God's people for quite some time. He knows that if he can get you to hold on to some little habits, some little sin that you can rationalize and, 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 and some little white lie, some little joke, that he can trap you and secure your destruction. You may ask the question, what is wrong with a little white lie every now and again? What is wrong with a little joke that's not so true? You see, the Patriarchs and Prophets, page 130, paragraph 1, Sister White says that no deviation from strict integrity can meet God's approval. 
And in the signs of the times, it says the least deviation from that law by neglect or willful transgression is sin. And every sin exposes the sinner to the wrath of God. You see, beloved, there is no middle ground. And the devil would have us to believe that we can go and live. We can do these small things. We can behave in these small ways and still have that form of godliness and, this, and, and, and convince ourselves that heaven is our home. It is a trap of the enemy, beloved friends, because Jesus Christ requires a complete surrender. He requires, beloved friends, that all our works, our thoughts, and our deeds be in line with him. We must live on earth now as we will live in heaven. You see, beloved friends, at the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. But the characters that we have now are the characters that will make it to heaven. We cannot take lightly this matter of the great controversy and think for a moment that we are safe by no means lest we are standing by the side of Jesus Christ or a rock. You see, the devil he takes no holidays. Monday is Labor Day. But the devil will be at our case just the same. He takes no holidays. He's seeking for your destruction. And we must, beloved friends, stand by the side of Jesus Christ every step of the way. Because there's a great war raging around us. And whether you like it or not, you are a part of it. This is another one of the devil's devices. He wants us to remain in this lukewarm state. A state where you find it okay to hold on to some parts of our carnal nature. A state when you find, you, you go through a checklist and you say, Alright, I have not lied today. I have not steal anything today. I honored my mother and my father today. Yes, I'm good to go. You see, God is not calling us to a checklist Christianity, but he's calling us to a relationship with him. And when that relationship is established, then you won't need to go through a checklist each day. Nothing but a complete surrender will do. The carnal nature must be starved, and the soul must walk with God in faith, letting go of everything that so easily beset us. Every bad habit, every small sin, every deviation from right, everything that prevents God to work completely in our life, we must let it go so we can live. The third thing that we hold on to sometimes that will not cause us to live our grudges and resentment. You see, we hold on to these feelings of resentment towards, e towards each other, towards the church, towards that company, towards that person. And these feelings suck the life out of healthy relationships and make us cold and unwelcoming. You see, beloved, it is something that we can relate to if you have been hurt. If you have had your feelings hurt, even by someone you love, you know it's hard to let go of these feelings. It's hard to really let go. But holding on is so dangerous. Holding on to these feelings is so dangerous. The principle is found in the Bible that if we forgive we will be forgiven. And Matthew 6, verse 12, the Bible says, And forgive us of our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Verse 14, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. 
And so the message is clear. The Bible tells us also of a man who owed the king a large sum of money. And the servant, not being able to pay his debt to the king, was sentenced to a life of slavery until he could repay. But the man begged the king, and the king had mercy on him and forgave him of his entire debt. Now this same man went out of the king's court and saw a fellow servant who owed him some money. And the new NIV version says, the man, verse 28, but when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. And when the king heard about this, he called this, this servant who he had forgiven and threw him into prison because he received mercy, but he was not willing to give that mercy to someone else. What am I saying, beloved friends? Can you say today that you have not received of God's rich grace and mercy? And if you are a recipient of that grace of, and mercy of God, then you must also be a distributor of that grace and mercy. What is the message for us today? If you want to be forgiven, you have to forgive others. You have to let go of these feelings of resentment and grudge. Since the second point, since you have been forgiven through the grace and mercy of God, you ought to forgive others. You ought to distribute the same grace and mercy. There is no letting go without a complete and genuine forgiveness. Think about it. Jesus came to lay down his life. 1 John 1.11 he came to his own, and they received him not. He was beaten. He was bruised. He was chastised. He was humiliated. He was mocked. His heart was broken. He went through the most severe torture known to man. He went through the most horrific pain that you can imagine. But Jesus bore it all for me. Jesus bore it all for you. Romans 5 verse 6 and 8, 6 to 8. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What am I saying? When I was undeserving, when I had nothing to offer to him, even though I was in full rebellion against him, he died for me so that I may live. He died for those who mocked him. He died for those who humiliated him. He died for those who nailed his fragile body to the Christ. Those that wept in horror of the sight. Those that laughed at him. And despite the fact that we did not deserve it, how much so can re we return that grace to those people who have hurt us the most? To those people who we think this do not deserve our forgiveness. We got to let go. We have to let go of these feelings of resentment. Feelings of, of hurt and pain. These feelings of guilt. These feelings of regret. And love our brothers and sisters completely. You see John 13 verse 34 and to 35, it says, A new commandment I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. 
so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We can't love our brothers and sisters completely if we hold grudges and feelings of resentment towards any person, towards anybody, because there is no place in heaven for these feelings. We must let go so we can live. We are called to love just as Jesus Christ loved. We can't hold grudges. We can't hold at an attachment to this world. We can't hold on to any part of our carnal nature. We must let go. You see, I don't know today, beloved friends, what is in your coconut or what is in your jar or what is it that you're holding on to or what you need to let go of. But whatever it is, beloved friends, I know that Jesus can give you the strength to let go so that you can live. There are two men. On one side, we have the rich young ruler who has everything. Scripture would suggest that he is an upstanding citizen. He has influence. He has kept all the commandments. He has wealth. But he approached Jesus as the good teacher. On the other hand, is a thief dying on the cross. And I can imagine, as he looked at the extent of his life, as he, as he was nailed on the cross, and the extent of his life flashed before his eyes, he recognized his poverty. He recognized his utter poverty and insufficiency. I can imagine as he looked at his situation, he realized that he was completely spent. He had nothing to offer. But he sees the Savior of the world beside him and approaches him as such. One man inquired, what can I do to be saved? And the other said unto Jesus, Lord, when you go in your kingdom, remember me. One man came just seeking answers, but the other was seeking salvation from Jesus Christ. One man came without faith, but one man, even though his situation seemed hopeless, he had enough faith and assurance that the man beside him, though was in the same position, the same situation, was able to save him. The message today, beloved friends, that when you're coming to Jesus, come in faith. Come boldly before the throne of God. You see, the thief on the cross understood that salvation was not found in anything else but Jesus Christ. We have to get to that place where we realize that your education cannot give you salvation. That your occupation cannot give you salvation. That your meditation cannot give you salvation. Nothing that you do merits the salvation that you receive. But it is only through Jesus Christ's spilt blood that we have the opportunity to gain eternal life. The dying thief, he had nothing to hold on to. He had no money. He had no legacy. He wasn't even named in scripture. He was out of time, not even time he didn't have. No way out of his situation. But he had hope and faith in the Savior by his side. You see, beloved friends, no matter what your situation is today, 
when Jesus is by your side, you will make it out. Today, by faith, you can let go of the thing that is holding you captive. The devil has no dominion and power in your life. You have the choice today, <coughs> sorry, to let go and live. By faith, you can lay hold of eternal life. The Bible tells us, eyes have not seen. Neither have it entered into the hearts of men the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And so today, my friends, the appeal is very simple. You know more than anybody else. The thing or the things that you're holding on to. The thing or the things that hold you captive. The thing or the things that keep you from having that complete surrender. The thing or the things that keep you from having that, uh, that, that complete relationship with God. And the appeal is simple, beloved friends. Let go and live. Or keep holding on. And die. You see, when we think about Calvary's cross, we have to make it personal. We have to realize that when Jesus died, he died for you. The pain that he went through was for you. The humiliation that he went through was for you. The lashes that tore his flesh, the, the blood that was spilled was for you. And when you make Jesus' sacrifice personal, then you come to a clear understanding that nothing but a complete surrender to him will do. Jesus let go of his life so that you may live. He laid down his life so that you may live. And there is nothing more precious, nothing more valuable than the opportunity that you have today to make your calling and election sure. Standing here today, wherever you are sitting in your homes, you're driving, you're listening to this sermon, whatever you're doing, the mere fact that you can hear this message means that there is still hope to access salvation from the Savior by your side. And I pray that God will give you the strength to let go and live. Let go and live. For if you hold on to this world, or hold on to any part of your carnal nature, or hold on to any feelings of resentment and grudge against one another, then you will not make it in. But God has done everything that he can do to save you. Let go so you can live. God bless you. Let us pray. Our loving God and our Savior, we are so blessed, Lord, because we have life and hope. We're so blessed, Lord, because you have spoken here today. And we pray, Lord, that these words that you have sent our way will find lodging in the fertile soil of our heart. Father, you know us even more than we know ourselves. And sometimes there are some things in our life that we hold on to that prevents you from working in us completely. And we pray, God, that you will reveal these things. That you will break these bonds. That you will paralyze every device that the enemy has in our lives that prevents us from living and making that complete surrender. We pray, mighty God, for each person listening over the electronic media today for these persons here today we pray mighty god that you will give us the strength to let go and live and recognize that 
salvation is only found in you. Nothing of ourselves. Nothing that we own. Nothing that we will own will merit the salvation that you have brought, bought with your life. And so we pray, God, that we will internalize this message today and make the sacrifice on Calvary's cross personal as it can be and recognize that you died for us while you were on the cross. We were on your mind. And we pray, Lord, that we will live so now as if we were in heaven. And we pray, God, that you hasten your coming. Because, Lord, we need to go home. This world is not our home. We are just passing through. But walk with us each day, Lord, as we go. And save us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.